We light the first candle in honor of Christianity. Self-rejection is the greatest enemy of the spiritual life because it contradicts the sacred voice that calls us the beloved. Being the beloved constitutes the core truth of our existence. We light the second candle in honor of Buddhism. The Buddha nature is simply the birthright of every sentient being. Our Buddha nature is as good as any Buddha's Buddha nature. We light the third candle in honor of the Shinto tradition. Everyone has a spirit that can be refined, a body that can be trained in some manner, a suitable path to follow. You are here to realize your inner divinity and manifest your innate enlightenment. We light the fourth candle in honor of Hinduism. The soul appears to be finite because of ignorance. When ignorance is destroyed, the self, which does not admit of any multiplicity, truly reveals itself by itself, like the sun when the clouds pass away. We light the fifth candle in honor of Islam. Stop acting so small. You are the universe in ecstatic motion. We light the sixth candle in honor of Judaism. In the proverbial beginning, there was something like a tremendous explosion of goodness, of godness, that at once created the universe and filled it. Now looked at the way this was disintegration, as the language of the text says, a decent, a descent of sparks of holiness into the outer darkness. Looked at it another way, it was the expansion of holiness to enlighten the darkness. We light the final candle in honor of the Native American religions. All things share the same breath, the beast, the tree, the man. The air shares its spirit with all the life it supports. Today's reading is from Ernest Holmes. Prayer, in its truest sense, is alignment, a unifying process which takes place in the mind as it reaches to its divine self and to the power which is greater than human understanding. In the act of such prayerful and reverent communion with God, one senses the unity of good, the completeness of life, and at a time the veil of doubt is lifted, and the face of reality appears. If you could, please go into a few moments of silence with me to contemplate these <laughs> words. and centered right here, right now, in this perfect moment. This moment of infinite love. I'm knowing that this time together is a time of wonderment, love, truth, beauty, and inspiration. I'm knowing that everyone here 
who has walked through these doors has walked into the arms of love. And I know that today's service is in perfect divine right order. That Reverend C.C. is inspired and imbued with the vision and the voice of love, the voice of God speaking in and through her. I know that our children in the back are so treasured and dearly loved and cared for. And I'm knowing that our, our music ministry is blessed and inspired. I know that everyone here is blessed. And I give thanks. I give thanks for this divine moment together in love. So be it. And so it is. So it is. In the Gospel of Thomas, the Gospel of Thomas, part of the Nag Hammadi scriptures, which were discovered in, in a cliff in Egypt in 1945. In the Gospel of Thomas, about the third verse, the writer says this. He says, if your teachers tell you, behold, the kingdom is in heaven, then the birds of heaven will get there before you. If, but if they say unto you, the kingdom of heaven is in the sea, then the fish will get there before you. But the kingdom is within you, and it is outside of you. Our founder, Ernest Holmes, said, It is beautiful to realize that every person stands in the shadow of a mighty mind, a pure intelligence, a divine givingness. The farmer has seen the heavenly host in the field. The, ch the child has frolicked with it at play. The mother has clasped it to her breast. And the fond lover has seen it in the eyes of their beloved. We look too far away for reality. He uses the capital R, reality, which is one of the ways that Ernest Holmes and, and that I think of this thing we call the divine. I don't think of it as a large human being. I don't think of it as simply an energy field. I think of it as that which is really, truly real, that which is real despite any misperception I might have of what's going on in life. That which is the very realist part of us. And, and he says, the farmer, the farmer has seen the heavenly host in the field. Indeed, that's one of the places we can find it, isn't it? Out in the fields, in the forests, in the mountains, in the deserts, in the middle of nowhere. If you can get far enough into nowhere to be able to see the stars away from the city lights and you look up and you see the Milky Way and the millions of stars that are there and it's, it's breathtaking. It's just breathtaking. The forest, whether it's that you know wonderful summer heat smell of dirt and leaves and growing things and warm earth and the sound of the birds, or whether it's the stillness of a forest that's filled with snow, or whether it's the riotous forest of fall, the really real can be experienced there. And then one of the things that all the religious traditions tell us is walking. Simple walking is another place we can experience the really real. Whether it's a labyrinth or a path in the forest or just walking across the grass barefoot, I think it was Thich Nhat Hanh who said, the greatest miracle to me is simply walking across the earth because you find out everything that's going on in this moment as you connect with that. Walking is an ancient practice. You know, the Muslims go to Mecca for the Hajj and they walk seven times around the Kaaba in the center courtyard of the, of the great mosque, walking counterclockwise. And each, that means they're going against the march of time. And each time they make a circuit, they're scraping off some of the poor behavior and erroneous thinking that's kind of crusted them over during their lifetime. That's the purpose of the Hajj, is to, to purify oneself. 
and labyrinths have been around forever and ever. There's a, a couple of thousand years before the Common Era, the Greeks built the, the Cretan labyrinth or something like it, as far as we can find it, at, at near Knossos in Greece. And much later, the labyrinth at Chartres Cathedral was built. And um, I think I told you last week about the, the monk who wanted to go to the Holy Sepulchre in Jerusalem. And he said he knew that if he got there and he walked around it three times and then knelt down, he would be changed. It's a it's it's the act of moving ourselves somewhere and recognizing that somewhere is holy. And it doesn't have to be Jerusalem or Mecca, it just has to be right where we are. Because if it's Mecca, somebody's gonna get there before us. And if it's Jerusalem, somebody's gonna get there before us. And if it's in the sea, the fish will get there first. It's wherever we are. It's wherever we are, and it's simply this looking and listening and being present to that whisper that's going on all around us all the time. We can find this capital R reality in nature, and we can also find it right where we are if we, if we take the time to observe what everyone calls, in some form or another, Sabbath time. It comes from the Hebrew, Shabbat, which means rest. And rest does not mean drinking beer and watching football. Rest does not mean reading. Rest does not necessarily mean sleeping. It, doesn't, it means doing nothing. It means doing nothing. No work, no socializing, no nothing. It means doing nothing. And that is so foreign to us. It's so foreign to us. But when we take a little bit of time to do nothing, I call it my stare at the wall time, things come to me that would not come otherwise. There are these whispers of capital R reality. Things come in, you know, like fully loaded, fully downloaded. Oh, that's it. It's not even a whisper. It's like a... The whole thing rolls out when I simply take the time to be still. That's what, in the reading, Holmes called this prayerful and, and reverent communion. We're prayerful and reverent communion that, that Holmes spoke of is simply making ourselves available in that sort of quiet, prayerful, restful space. Lots of stuff happens to us there that doesn't happen when we don't give it the time. We find answers. We find peace. We find expansion. So we can find it in the forest and walking and all those other places, but I think maybe the biggest place we find it is in community with each other. That's where we can really find capital R, reality, in the face of the person we're sitting next to. Everywhere we look, says the Quran, everywhere I look, I see the face of God. And in order to do that, we have some pretty serious scales we have to take off our own eyes. Scales we learn in society. Scales that we're taught. We have to learn how to see each other differently. It requires um, maybe the most real spiritual practice of all, and that is to... to Tip your consciousness into the awareness that you're looking into the eyes of God with the eyes of God. And it takes some conscious tipping to get there. To get there. You know, <clears throat> there are lots of <clears throat> there are lots of stories about this kind of thing in the world's spiritual traditions as well. The Desert Fathers, which many of you I'm sure have heard about. Um, they went off and found caves so they could live by themselves and, and find God and do their meditation and their spiritual practice. But even they gathered ultimately in community. The, one, the, the person who, the Egyptian monk, Brother Anthony, who founded the, the whole tradition of monasteries, first he went and lived in a cave for 20 years by himself. And then he left and came out and, and said... We, I, I can't do this alone. I can't find out if I've made any progress without interacting with other people. So he, he created a, a series of caves 
And people lived in caves and sort of together in a community. And, and one of his visitors said their cells, like tents, were filled with singing, fasting, praying, and working so they might give alms and having love and peace with each other. And that was the birth of the monastery a long time ago in the desert. One of the desert fathers had a saying. He said, uh, if you see a young monk trying to climb up into heaven by himself, grab him by the foot and pull him back down because that kind of thing is not good for him. And it's not good because we're all in this together. You know, this climbing into heaven, this bringing heaven down to earth is something we do together. We can't do it alone. All we can create by ourselves is an illusion that everything is wonderful. We can't test it until we run into each other. You know what I mean? There's another great desert father's tale. There was a, an obstreperous old monk who decided he would fast for 70 weeks in order to have God reveal to him more. He was almost dead from hunger. He ate once a week. He was almost dead from hunger, and he said, God, reveal to me the meaning of this certain passage. And he got absolutely nothing, nothing. So he finally said, I'm going to die, so I'm going to haul myself out of my cell and go ask my brother, a fellow monk, what this passage means. And the instant he got up, walked out, closed the door behind him, the angel of God appeared and said, your fast got you nothing, but you've humbled yourself to ask your brother. So God sent me to reveal the meaning of this passage. <laughs> See, we can't do it by ourselves. We think we can. And maybe the hardest spiritual work we have to do is that second great commandment, love thy neighbor as thyself. Maybe that's the hardest the hardest thing you have to do is to encounter each other as divine incarnations, whatever you consider the divine to be. To encounter each other not as somebody to change or fix or enroll or use or, or anything like that, but simply as someone who can spring us from the prison of ourself. Because all by ourselves, I don't know about you, but it can get pretty weird in here if I'm all by myself. And being with other people springs me out of that prison. I don't know any other way, because we can be very, very conscious in meditation and solitary spiritual practice, but we don't know how, how we're doing, really, and so we come out and rub shoulders with each other and see the fruits of our solitary spiritual practice in action. Because I think with the people we're habituated to, our spouses and our kids and the people we hang out with a lot, we sort of build up um, a whole series of justifications about why things happen the way they do, right? Well, it's my husband's fault because that's the way he is, or my kids are just not old enough and mature enough to understand, or it drives me crazy when they do that and they know it and they do it anyway, or whatever those justifications might be, whatever they might be. But we've got these patterns of doing things. When we're out here mixing it up with each other, our tender spots, people find the unprotected sort of the side in the armor and, and we get poked all the time. We get poked all the time. And we get the chance to look for God and the one who's pushing our buttons and we get the chance to forgive ourselves for having those tender spots to begin with. We all have them. We all have them. There's a, a wonderful book by an Episcopal priest, Barbara Brown Taylor, and it's called An Altar in the World. And it's about all of this. It's about finding God wherever you are, finding the divine, finding the sacred everywhere. She says, all you have to do is recognize another you out there, your other self in the world, for whom you care as ex as in let me try that one again. That's yeah. hard. For whom you care as instinctively as you care for yourself. To become that person, even for a moment, she says, is to understand what it means to die to yourself. Even for a moment. This can be as frightening as it is liberating. It may be the only real spiritual discipline there is. That's some strong language. The only spiritual discipline there is. The only real one. But I get where she's coming from. I get it. The small s 
itself is going to try to protect itself when someone pushes on a sore spot. Usually by finding, well, we'll usually find a way to blame them for the fact that we have a sore spot, right? It's what we do. It's just what we do. So the spiritual discipline is to say, that's my other self in the world. This person who's push, pushing on my buttons is my other self in the world. How can I respond instinctively with caring instead of blaming? How can I respond instinctively with love instead of with, hmm, leave me alone. Just what, that's, you know, this is how I see myself as like Wonder Woman, sh you know, <laughs> getting, keeping everyone at bay sometimes. <laughs> When someone's rude to you, what do you usually do? My first instinct is to, um, my first instinct, which I try not to follow, is to be rude back, bigger, louder, smarter. What I try to do instead is walk away for a minute until I can get my cool back. But my instinctive, loving response, if I were to see the other self, my other self in that person, I would give them some care of some sort. I would give them some love of some sort. There's a great story about Jackie Robinson, the black baseball player who broke the color barrier in 1945 for the Dodgers. As he was getting ready to join the team, the branch manager, uh, branch, or the general manager, Branch Rickey, he's not a branch manager, his name is Branch Rickey, he said, I'm looking for a ball player with guts enough not to fight back. He was looking for a, someone who was a great athlete and a gentleman, he said. Someone with the inner strength and the self-restraint to withstand what Jackie Robinson was going to have to withstand as the first black ball, professional ball player. There was a lot of hostility. There was a lot of aggression. But Robinson did come to understand that not fighting back was the ultimate testament to his courage, his strength of character. He used water instead of fire to fight the fire that was coming at him. He used water. It was the water of his own courage. I mean, he would be in the field, you know, if he'd be running bases and white infielders would spit on him as he ran by. Um, pitchers would throw the ball purposely to hurt him. People would call him names all the time. He'd come out onto the, to the field and people would be chanting racial slurs. It was awful. It was awful. But he realized that the only way to fight back was to stay in the major leagues and be so good and so polite, and so untouched that he'd proved the point that he belonged there. Because that was what everyone said. African Americans don't belong in Major League Baseball. He said, want to bet? And he showed them. He realized that um, being kind and classy, responding with compassion when he could and silence when he couldn't, was his true strength. And I'm so grateful I've never been tested by that. Like that, you know, I mean, I've been, I've had to be patient about the fact that I'm female, but I'm way privileged. I don't have to worry about being gay or lesbian or transgendered or a person of color or a Muslim American gets called terrorist on the street. My tests are easy. I've been called honey by judges and patted on the head. When I was practicing law, one of my appointments said, well, you're a feisty little gal. I said, that's not a compliment. <laughs> but it was easy. Nothing like what other people have to put up with in, in our world, you know. So how can we, all of us, respond to those other people, no matter how they're behaving, and say, there's my other self. That's my other self in the world. There was a great article in the LA Times the other day it was an article about um, the escalation of rudeness in our society, which I, I've noticed. I, you know, people saying thank you when you do them a favor, or, or thank you to the wait person when they bring your food, or God forbid someone should hold a door for you, right? I'm always holding doors for people, and they sail on through without a word, and I think, it's not how my mama raised me. I always say thank you, but that's just who I am. So, so we have this, this, you know, kind of, we're all too busy and people get really rude. And she came across an older woman on a bench who was just flat out hot and tired and said, oh my God, it's hot, do you know where I can get a Diet Coke? So this woman had been 
dealing with rudeness all day instead of answering, she went and got a Diet Coke and a glass of ice and brought it back to the lady on the bench, who was overwhelmed with gratitude at that simple little kind act. And the, the author was totally changed by doing that kind act. She said, it's pretty amazing. A small kindness that's no big deal when you do it for someone you know is incredibly powerful when you do it for someone you don't. It's also like likely to have cascading societal returns, she said. There was research by a psychologist, whose name is Sonia Lubomirsky, and she found that the recipients of kind acts were three times as likely to do kind acts for, for others. So we do a kind act for a stranger, and they're three times as likely to pass it on, to pass it on. So, you know, we simply reach out to our co-humans, our other selves in the world, and we can transform our society little by little by little, one day, one kind act at a time. From, this writer said, a vast strangeropolis to a really, really big neighborhood. Wouldn't that be great? A really, really big neighborhood. A minimum of one kind act a day should be our self-imposed cover charge for living in this world. I love that. We get the society we create or, we, or the society we let happen to us. So I don't know about you, but I vote for the society we can create by being kind to each other, by looking in the eyes of the other and saying, that's my other self. This is, I'm looking with the eyes of God into the eyes of God. This is my other self in the world. That's what heaven on earth looks like when we create that big neighborhood where people go and get a Diet Coke because you're you know, old and hot and tired and stuck on a bench somewhere. Or where people say please and thank you and do kind things for each other. That's the heaven on earth that is all around us. If we activate it, if we see it and call it forth. Especially, you know, when we see someone doing just the opposite. I think that's when it's especially difficult and especially important that we say, that is my other self in the world. What can I do to this person, for this person, not to them? What can I do for this person that will let them feel loved in this moment? What can I do? Smile. Hold the door for them. Say, I hope you're having a great day. Whatever it is, those tiny little kind acts. That's the real spiritual discipline of seeing the other as ourselves, of loving the other as ourselves, of, of responding with care and love instead of with armor or an eye for an eye or I'm going to give you better than you gave me. See, it all becomes ours to create day by day a society where we see the divine age in each other. That is our perpetual spiritual discipline, I think. And when we commit to that perpetual spiritual discipline, we all know what happens next. We start to see it more and more and more and more. Everywhere we go, we see the face of God. And there's only one thing to do when everywhere we go we see the face of God, and that is to love it, to recognize it as your other self in the world because that's who each one of you are, the face of God. So join me for a moment of simply allowing your awareness to fall into that inner sanctum, that chamber within yourself where there is stillness. That chamber that you find in meditation or contemplation or Sabbath quiet that chamber that is beyond all the fuss of the world, that is beyond the smartphone and the, and the computer, beyond Facebook and politics, beyond errands and to-do lists, beyond resentments, into that place where there is peace. As Paul said, a peace that passes understanding. It's always there. All we have to do is allow ourselves to find it all we have to do is to allow ourselves to spend a moment in it each day, resting, remembering, 
filling up our cup so that as we go forth into the world to see our other in the world, our other self, we do so with a full cup, a full heart, a fortified spirit, a calm sense of well-being. So as we go forth and set this intention to be the, the person who creates that neighborhood of heaven right here and right now on earth, right where we are, I know that each one of us does so filled to overflowing with love, with joy, with support, with kindness, with compassion, with peace, with abundance and vitality with all manner of good things as we simply recognize that they're all here already, already, already. We accept them, we allow them, we become the place where the givingness of spirit enters and then flows out into the world so that we are never using our own resources to look out in, with the eyes of God into the eyes of God. We are simply allowing ourselves to be the place that happens because it happens so naturally so easily so effortlessly because God is present everywhere everywhere all the time flowing through me flowing through you flowing through and between all of us so I say thank you God for this community that is willing to say I will be that one I will be that one who sees and acknowledges and responds, not reacts, but responds with love. How grateful I am for this group of people that is shining such light into, into our corner of the world. How grateful I am to know that this is the truth of our being. How grateful I am. And so in gratitude, I release these words, knowing and trusting that that divine being by whatever name we call it, has already said yes, as it always does. Yes, my beloved. Yes, my beloved. Yes. So I let it go. I let it be. And we say together, and so it is. <laughs>
now have an opportunity to give in support of our spiritual center. So I would ask you to just stop and fill yourself up with gratitude. Think about all the things you're so blessed to have in your lives. The people, the puppies, <laughs> the friends, the health, the privilege, the well-being, all of it. There's so much to be grateful for every single day, for life itself, for our homes and our families, for all that we have, and for this spiritual center which provides us a place to learn and grow and our kids to find out how fabulous they are and for meditation practice to happen and so many other things. So just take a moment to be grateful. I know with me, my heart is open. My heart is open. I give from my open heart. I give from my open heart. I know that as I give, I am given to I know that as I give, I am given to. And I am grateful. And I am grateful. And so it is. And so it is. Here, Vic. Oh. Thanks. <laughs> okay, this evening at 7 p.m., join us for a spectacular laser curtain with Carl Anthony. I'm assuming he's still here. Come and experience the beauty of this practice of chanting and resting and connecting accompanied by music and a laser light show. Tickets are still available, and um, they're, are they $25 now? No, they're 20 until tonight. At 20 until it's tonight, so if you want, haven't bought them, buy them now. Um, and because Christmas falls on Sunday this year, and because our musicians would rather be home with their families, we'll have just one service Sunday morning at our regular time. Join us for carols and a special Christmas message. And then on New Year's Day, come for a burning bowl ceremony and we'll chart our course for the new year together. Gifts for the family from our giving tree need to be here wrapped, tagged, and closed by business tomorrow, Monday, December 19th. And the animal tree gifts can come in until January the 5th. Grab whatever tags are left and make sure we give these two families and the animals at the rescue a wonderful holiday. The other no, no. Page. This one? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I'm sorry, I didn't practice. <laughs> Please take a look at the last page of the bulletin and add the insert for more information on these and other activities that are coming up. Also, in your bulletin, you'll find two cards, like this. One has a yellow flower on it and says, we want to hear from you, and the back has a few questions on it. The leadership council members really do want to hear from you, so please take a moment to fill it out and put it in the large wooden box on the table by the door. We'd love to hear your thoughts and ideas. The other card is an invitation to our service on January the 8th. There are more of them over at the Welcome Center. Take a few with your holiday season and give one to friends and families who might like what we are all about here. The postcard will help you invite them and we'll have a great service followed by soup and salad for lunch. And if you would like prayer after the service, our licensed prayer practitioners would love to pray for you. Just look for those of us with our white or teal. You can do white, I'll do teal. Okay. okay. <laughs> prayer shawl. <laughs> These women, have, we women have studied and practiced and prayed for many years, and we hope to see the spiritual truth for each and every one when you can't. This is our gift to you as a one-minute miracle of prayer. You may also put a written prayer request in the prayer box on the table, and we'll pick it up after the service. Thank you to everybody who's made this morning's service possible. Our ushers, greeters, our practitioners, the welcome team, everywhere, everyone working on the brunch, the Higher Mind Band, and you for showing up on this morning. Please stand for our closing affirmation. She is. Back. Speak to us, girl. <laughs> I know the divine is everywhere. I know the divine is everywhere. 
I find it within myself. I find it within myself. Within everyone I meet. Within everyone I meet. Everywhere I look. Everywhere I look. Whenever I find it. Whenever I find it. I love it. I love it. And so it is. And so it is.